97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. You know, we, we recognize the, the ability of the roster that's, that's put together right now. And I think we have the ability to do something really special uh, with this group, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. It's powered by the Inside the Birds podcast and brought to you by PlaySugarHouse.com. Sign up now. They'll match your first deposit up to $250. Go to PlaySugarHouse.com. Win real money. With their sports books, along with the casino games from the comfort of your home, must be 21 or older to play. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Andrew DeCecco is in the house today for today's Football at Four. We'll get some opinions from him on the loss and obviously what's next. What are some of the things they need to fix and improve on as he joins us now, like all guests, on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Andrew, what's up, pal? Hey, doing well, Mike. How are you? Everything is great, and uh, well, not in Eagles land. We got a lot of people complaining out there. Can you believe it? Uh, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> uh, let's get some uh, some thoughts from you over at ninety seven three ESPN dot com. You have plenty of coverage on this game and in this team. As Doug Peterson touched on a bunch of topics from week one, you also had uh, a bunch of observations from the loss. So let's start with that. Everybody's observation of Carson Wentz. Where do you sit uh, with the way Carson Wentz played on Monday, uh, Sunday? Well, it was definitely a tale of two halves, Mike. When you got to see him come out and get off to a fast start, he really willed the offense to really, it was pretty much all of him. Like the fifth five yarder to Jalen Rager really jump started the offense. He threw a dart to Zach Ertz for the first touchdown. And I really was impressed with this 34-yarder to Dallas Goddard over his outside shoulder away from the defensive back, leading the receiver. That was a tremendous pass. And then in the second half, he really reverted back to some of the things that really caused them to spiral out of control over the past couple of seasons. And the team was really in survival mode later in that game. And you kind of got to see some of his, some of his blemishes really come to the surface. Um, how much of the – okay, so obviously Wentz did not play well in the second half. How much do you attribute that to the offensive line and the problems that they had? I think the offensive line's largely to blame for that, but let's not discount the fact that Wentz made some poor decisions with the football. He didn't – he held on to the ball for far too long looking to make something happen rather than throw the football away. His interceptions were – were forced passes. They were kind of floaters to the defensive back. And to rookie uh, John Hightower really didn't – I mean, his receivers didn't do him any favors by – they weren't working back to the football. But they really – you know, some of those passes were, were ill-advised. And they really were almost infatuated and fascinated with the deep ball rather than – you know, whatever happened to the to the drag routes or the crossing routes or, or the, the short passing game. If your running game is not working, why not look to the short passing game, which is an extension of the running game? I didn't see any of the, many of the things that I anticipated seeing, and they kind of went away from that in the second half when things were when things were kind of rolling, and they they really the, the drives were stalling and they, and they couldn't get anything going. So, if you were to put in order who's to blame first between Doug Peterson, the offensive line, and Carson Wentz, how would you order those three? Um, I, I would say I would say Doug Peterson, Carson Wentz, and the offensive line. The offensive line was what it was, Hunter. It, they, they, uh, Jack Driscoll and Nate Herbig did some nice things on the first couple of drives. And you, you go into the game knowing you have two, start, two guys making their first NFL starts on the right side. And they, but, they, but as Doug kind of intimated uh, yesterday, those guys have been seeing a lot of work that it just hasn't really been seen. Those guys have been getting a lot of first-team work. So you really know what you have there. And you, had, and you were finding out what was working in the first half. And to get away from that in the second half, that, that to me falls on play calling and inadequate play from your quarterback. On that offensive line, uh, Herbig, three snaps last year, Driscoll, a rookie. How surprised were you that Pryor did not get a look at all on Sunday? Because not only did he not get the chance to start, once there was an injury, he wasn't even the next guy in. So why do you think Pryor was passed over? I was very surprised, but you know, he really did not have a strong summer. They gave him the first crack at starting at right guard when Brandon Brooks went down with his injury and he really didn't do much to, 
really cement his spot as a starter. And you got to see different guys such as Nate Herbig and Jack Driscoll that really rose to the occasion. And I think the team felt more comfortable moving forward with them. The part that really surprised me was that when Jack Driscoll left the game late in the second half due to cramps, it was Jordan Mailata who they called upon rather than Matt Pryor, which tells you all you need to know about where they think about Matt Pryor because he was by for all you know by all accounts he was healthy for that game. I think he may have just fell. The fall from grace was was so dramatic over the past couple of months that I think he's now on third team. How much of a difference does Lane Johnson make entering next week's game? Is that the difference in winning the game or not? Are they still going to have flaws in that offensive line? How big is his impact, do you think, for week two? Well, I think his impact is monumental. Lane Johnson at 70 or 75% is better than most offensive linemen in the NFL. There were, there were some problems in it that, that didn't just come from the right side. Jason Peters struggled with some of the speed and athleticism from the Washington defensive front. The, Isaac Sayamalu had his had his moments where, where he wasn't on his A game, and you still have Nate Herbig who is still going through some growing pains. But they but Doug intimated that he was he was pleased with what he saw from Herbig. But you know it's only going to be a second game, so there's going to be some growing pains to go along with Nate Herbig, and they really don't have many other options. So there are so while Lane Johnson will solidify that right tackle spot. There's going to be some leaky spots there uh, along the along the uh, offensive line. And you, let's not forget you have Aaron Donald and company coming into town, and uh, you know that's that's not the Washington defensive front, but they do have some guys out there that can make it pay. Yeah. Now, yesterday, Doug Peterson did say that he thought Herbig, you know, on the on the tape that he played pretty well. Um, that you know, sure he wasn't perfect. Would you concur that you think that Herbig is the best option to play right guard? They're going to get Lane Johnson back. He said today. Uh, on the Gun On One podcast that he will be out there. But is mm-hmm. Herbig the right guy to play next to him? Pryor started next to him in the playoff game last year. Yeah, and, and Pryor played relatively well. I mean, I said, I've said i said it. Trey Thomas has been on with you guys, and he said it too, which is why I was a little puzzled why he didn't get the you know the first opportunity to, to kind of come out there with uh, with the starting unit. I think that right now they're really high on Nate Herbig. He made the team undrafted last season out of Stanford, which was a hard feat, and then he followed that up with making it again with no preseason. They obviously really like him. He's a different body type than a Matt Pryor. Matt Pryor is more of a more of a longer uh, longer guy with with reach, and Nate Herbig's more of a a stout plow ahead, you know, type of offensive lineman that really doesn't necessarily fit what Jeff Stoutman likes in his offensive lineman as far as athleticism, but I think that they really like the fit there with Nate Herbig and the fact that he does provide versatility. It sounds like Doug Peterson was really happy with what he saw, encouraging uh, encouraging progress from Nate Herbig, so I think he will be the guy, and they're trying to build continuity there, so he certainly will get another opportunity on Sunday, and then getting Lane Johnson back is going to be um, instrumental to their success. A name that really hasn't been brought up too much when it comes to this offensive line on Sunday was uh, Kelsey. How did you feel that he played? Do you think that he struggled a bit because maybe what was going on in that on that right side, or are you okay with how he was individually? You know, Kelsey, he, he's pretty he's pretty solid each and every week because he he's always out muscled and outsized by the defensive tackles that he goes against, but. Yeah, were there some plays that I thought that he struggled on that he would like to have back? Absolutely. But I thought, you know, by and large, he really stood firm in there. Despite all the chaos going on around him, I thought he was one of the more solid offensive linemen on, uh, that the Eagles had on Sunday, which is really what you expect from, you know, an all-pro center. I think that, you know, some of his, some of his deficiencies on Sunday were largely in part due to, the, uh, due to the right side a lot of inexperience on the right side. So yeah. I think that's where a lot of the pressure was coming from. Yeah, a lot of uh, inexperience over there. But getting Lane Johnson back, you'll have Peters, Sayamalo, Kelsey, probably Herbig, and Lane Johnson. Uh, is is the offensive line going to be an issue if that's your five guys? I mean, yeah, obviously you had two guys making their first starts on the right side together. But is just getting Lane Johnson back and then getting everything back to where you thought it might be saved for the right guard spot, you know, after game one, you're like, my God, this line's such a weak spot. But is it really moving forward? Yeah, the offensive line is going to be problematic throughout the season, barring a trade or or or, but yeah, barring a trade because this is really there's not much out there in free agency. So this is really what you have. And unfortunately, yes, it'll be a little bit, it'll be marginally better getting Lane Johnson there. But there's going to be, 
the occasional blunders. Jason Peters go, is going to likely come out of games uh, and you know may may even miss time. There's going to be guys coming in and out, shuffling in and out of the offensive line, and so there's not going to be a ton of continuity there. But obviously, bringing Lane Johnson back, who's the best right tackle in football, if he's one of, if not the best right tackle in football, having him out there is going to definitely make that obviously make the offense run a lot smoother. But there's going to be problems there throughout the season because. You know, how many times can you ask a Jordan Mailata to step in there and give you quality snaps when he really didn't have a preseason? He spent time on the COVID list. He, 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 he's the guy that really could have benefited from extra snaps. And then you're looking into, you know, Sua Opeta and a lot of those guys. And, you know, those guys, are, they're more developmental guys, Mike, right now. And they're not necessarily ready to be thrown. And it's not fair to ask them to go out there and throw them out there against, you know, some all-world players and say, you know, here, here you go. Um, talk with uh, Andrew DeCecco, of course, football at four, our 97.3 ESPN.com Eagles insider, and he joins us here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Uh, how much did not having Miles Sanders to start the game and then Boston Scott getting hurt in-game and then Corey Clement not practicing most, most of the week, how much do you think that deterred um, uh, Peterson from going to the run? I mean, the disparity was was terrible. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm not necessarily sure that Miles Sanders, I mean, he can create a little bit more, and he's more explosive than both Boston Scott and Corey Clement, but there really wasn't a whole lot going by way of the run. There was always a defensive lineman in the backfield. Boston Scott was getting lost back there. Corey Clement really never got his footing. This is a game where, and I, I tweeted about this, where I watched the, the L.A. Chargers play later in the, that afternoon, and they have a rookie named Joshua Kelly who I've been particularly high on. He's a bigger back. He's very, he's very nimble on his feet, but when you compare it to what they have with Austin Eckler, you have this, the speed and finesse that he has, and you also have the, the power and size uh, and the inside running ability that Joshua Kelly has. And he really – they don't win that game without, without Joshua Kelly's ability. And I think that when you really look at what the Eagles – did, were lacking on Sunday. It's really someone who could pound the ball between the tackles, grind out those tough yards. Even when their running game is not going, you want a guy who can fall full, fall forward for three or four yards and at least pose as a threat. You know, to at least have that as an option to run the football. I lost sleep over this quote from Doug Peterson after the game. I asked Moshe about it. I asked Gail about it. I want to get your thoughts about it. After the game, he was asked about the disparity in run and pass plays, and he responded with, he doesn't know in-game if he's calling a run or pass. He's just worried about the execution. How do you interpret that co- uh, that quote? Well, that's a, that's a little bit frightening, if you ask me, to, to have your head coach say that. I, I think, you know, he, he may be – a lot of coaches do this. They, they get lost in the – in the thick of things during the game and they focus on the execution and they, the, in the Eagle, I, I really don't know really what to make, what to make of that, to be honest with you. I just think that <laughs> the fact that they have, the only thing I could kind of conjure up is that they have so many different offensive minds now in this particular case where, you know, you have all these different opinions and he, he may not know, he may not be aware of what's fully being called, but it's really, that's really an odd thing to say, especially to, you know, at a press conference, but um, yeah, I, I can't say I've ever really heard a, a head coach say that before. What's your take on the way he um, kind of addressed the Deshaun Jackson stuff? I mean, he played 54%. He's saying, you know, hey, uh, we got a long season ahead. I mean, what are you, load managing the guy? Like, <laughs> what do you make of what? I mean, was he being, like, is it fair to ask whether he was being punished at all? Yeah, because Deshaun, what made this even more confusing was Deshaun's tweet that he put out after the game that he that he was healthy and he felt fine. Okay, well, if he's healthy and felt fine, this seemed to be the perfect opportunity to really stretch the Washington secondary, get him against Ronald Darby, and really take advantage of Deshaun's ability to you know take the top off of uh, of a secondary. So to only play him, I believe it was 37 snaps when I think Rager led the receiving core with 40. They only played Deshaun 37 snaps to put him on load management. Well, last time I checked, you know, there's only 16 games in a season. So what are you really preserving here? He went, he was by, he went into the game healthy. He wasn't hurt during the game. I don't understand necessarily treating him like Joel Embiid in this situation. And when you really were struggling on offense to get anything going, you to, to really limit your, your primary deep threat, uh, that's, that was another head scratcher. That was one of the biggest head scratchers to come out of Sunday. The way that I look at what, like offensively, the way that I look at it is it's similar to baseball, home run or strikeout. Did it feel that way for you that they were just trying to force the long ball too much with Rager or Deshaun Jackson? 
Yeah, and the thing was, it, they connected early, and I felt like they wanted to keep going back to the well, and I thought that they did that too much. There was guys that were running under. You know, you look and see, you have two tight ends that were finding success in intermediate routes in the beginning of the game. Why not go back to that? That was what, that was what was working. Why not utilize Boston Scott's ability to turn a screen pass into a long gain, and Corey Clement, for that matter, and Greg Ward, who made a couple of tough catches over the middle, Instead, they were misfired. They were, they were going after the deep ball to uh, Jalen Rager. They were force, forcing that they were trying to make John Hightower a thing for week one. They really wanted him to be, they were making him a feature part of the offense. I believe he played 27 snaps and J.J. Arcega Whiteside only played 28. And that's a whole separate story because he didn't even get a target. But uh, it, it just felt like they were forcing things, Hunter. And instead of taking what the defense was giving you, I thought that they got away from what was making them so successful in the first half. Why Why are Thigo Whiteside no targets? Is it just, okay, he, this is what he is? I think this is more of what he is. He's a possession guy, but to have to have him play 28 snaps and not even receive a target, it, it, it just, he doesn't create much separation. They never really got into that red zone area where like they're 10 to 15 yards out and they're, they're, they're giving someone a chance to kind of to lob it up there or a fade pattern and have him go up there and use his size and ability to play above the rim to go get the football. He just really hasn't been utilized to his strengths, but he's really a one-dimensional player. He's not someone that can, that's going to be a burner. His route running is still a work in progress. Like I said, John Hightower in the beginning of the game was getting more looks and getting more playing time than J.J., so to have someone that you, you hear so much about throughout the summer, he's having a great summer, he's having a great summer. Well, that's why when I was on the show before the season started, I said temper your expectations because doing it in shorts and in practice is one thing, but how many times have we seen so many of these players that are training camp stars and then you get into the regular season and they're kind of invisible? So this is now the second season that J.J. has yet to produce or gotten off to a slow start after having a, a strong summer. What were your overall thoughts on Jalen Rager? Obviously, the big bomb is, is what stands out, but what did you think in terms of route running and other aspects of his game? You know, just that, you know, from the naked eye, I, I, I was very impressed with it. I thought he, he composed himself very well for a player playing in his first NFL game, and let's not forget, he made a very quick turnaround from that injury. Didn't show any signs of, of that lingering, and I just to go up there and, and catch the catch that deep football. I mean, how many how many? I wonder how many Eagles fans couldn't help but think he's going to drop it. He's going to drop it. He's going to drop it because you're so used to that 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 inadequate play from from last season and the inefficiency from the receivers to be able to track a deep ball. So to have a have a young player, you know, go up there and catch the football in that situation when you had to have it, I thought that was encouraging. It, it didn't. The game didn't look like it was too big for him. His route running looked as good as advertised as the, as the feedback that I've been hearing. So I think there's some encouraging signs from Jalen Rager and obviously leading the receivers in snaps was certainly encouraging from his first game. Well, uh, it was funny because the, the, what happened in that game, he either the interception or he had the drop or something. And I said, the oh, interception was it. I, I said, Oh, I guess you won't see high tower the rest of the game. Now they go, they did yeah. put him back out there, but um, it, it, it'll be interesting to see what his role is moving forward. Uh, next to Ortega Whiteside, like in other words, has he passed Ortega Whiteside in terms of hey, he's going to he got more snaps on Sunday, but it, or, or even more snaps going to go to Hightower because it seems that they are enamored with speed. Yeah, and one thing that if you remember, I believe it was about a, one or two months ago, and Adam reaffirmed this on the Inside the Birds podcast the other day, speaking to his sources. But one thing that I mentioned, I said, look, they really put everything, all their eggs into the Deshaun Jackson basket. They really prioritized and overemphasized speed that I thought because if Deshaun were to exit the game or not be 100% or whatever the case is, then all of a sudden, and Alshon's not in the picture, at least for the first couple of weeks, then all of a sudden you're relying on Jalen Rager and uh, day three rookie and um, John Hightower, who really is not big enough and he needs to get stronger, and he really shouldn't be playing 27 snaps in, in any game, let alone his first NFL game. And then you also have, obviously, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, who we don't really know what to make of him, but he, has a, he had a disappointing rookie season. And Greg Ward, who's pretty much a slot player, who can, he's going to create, he's going to come up with a tough catches, but he's not going to give you much after the catch. So there's a lot of limitations there outside of Deshaun Jackson. So the receiving core may have looked to revamp and, and and have a new look, but you really don't have that go up and get it guy that that can come up, go up between the hashes and get the football like an Alshon Jeffrey. They're very limited in what they can do 
um, because they put so much emphasis on speed. What do you make out of the Jalen Hurts situation? Well, I, I, he's someone that I always thought would be a factor later in the season rather than early in the season. I didn't necessarily think that he would be active for his first for the first game. Now, from your second round pick, you do expect to, you expect to get something out of them, and I know that that's one of the head scratchers when you really didn't get much out of your second or third round pick on Sunday or your second round pick from last season. So that's certainly concerning, but he, he's a guy that I do anticipate them throwing in some wrinkles as the season wears on a little much, little, he probably had a lot on his, on his plate. And, and given the condensed off season, some guys pick up things quicker than others. And I, and I, and I think that maybe they kind of want to ease him into the, uh, to the flow of things. What did uh, Slay add to the defense? Slay was fantastic. You know, outside of the missed tackle that uh, Jim Schwartz also alluded to, they played about uh, 50 of the 60 snaps were man coverage, which they really haven't done much of. He had Terry McClellan. He only allowed two catches, and I believe it was for like 26 yards. He was as advertised on Sunday and very encouraging. I thought the secondary as a whole, Mike, really looked solid. I thought Avante Maddox, he should have had an interception, but I thought he was very sticky, very instinctive back there, got his hands on some footballs. Um, you know, I thought Jalen Mills was pretty aggressive in his first game at safety. There was there was some a lot to like there from the secondary. Uh, the linebackers obviously given up that that play to Logan Thomas. I thought um, I thought was a, a big error there. But other than that, they didn't really do anything one way or the other to kind of tip the scale. They were kind of they were kind of just there. But I, I, as far as the secondary, I saw a lot to uh, a lot to like. When it comes to that defensive front, Brandon Graham and concussion protocol and Vinnie Curry will be out. Should we be concerned at that position now? Oh, yeah, I think you have to be concerned because let's not forget Derek Barnett still, uh, he's still on the mend. Uh, we don't know where he stands as far as his status. We'll find out more this week. So you, all of a sudden you don't have Derek Barnett. You may not have Brandon Graham. Um, and, and Vinnie Curry is going to be out for a significant amount of time. So let's look at what we have here. We have Josh Sweat. We have Jannard Avery. Casey Tuhill is going to have to be active for his first game. But, you know, it's, are you going to ask a seventh-round rookie to play 20 snaps and, and then elevate a, a Joe Osman, who you may have to, you know, he may, he's probably going to have to be activated from the practice squad to give him four defensive linemen and, He's going to have to give you maybe eight to ten snaps, and then you also have the possibility of Malik Jackson that can play. Uh, he can slide outside. He offers that flexibility as well. But they have to do something there because they just don't have enough bodies. All right, uh, football at four. Andrew DeCecco, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and of course, uh, the Eagles getting ready for the L.A. Rams. You'll hear that game this Sunday at one, right here on ninety-seven three ESPN. Coverage begins at 10 o'clock in the locker room with Billy and Hunter as they will take you right up until the Eagles radio network. Eagles, Rams, it feels like round three. It seems like those two teams play each other every single year. We'll get Andrew's thoughts on that game a little bit later on in the week. And he, like all guys, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. Andrew, take care, pal. Yep, you too, guys. All right, uh, Andrew will be back later on in the week. You can get his coverage right now. At 97.3 ESPN.com, he's got a bunch of post-game Eagles coverage up.